There is a word that used to be regularly used among churches of Christ throughout the land. Still is by some and ought to be by all. And that word is the word pattern. Pattern. It's interesting that when you go to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, that the inspired writer to the Hebrews quoted Moses or referenced Moses in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 9, writing, Moses was admonished of God. When he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Now that's said in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. It lets us know the value, at least some of the value of the Old Testament to those of us who are members of the Lord's church and understanding our duties to God. And that is simply that there is a certain way that one does things. God has delivered them to us and we're not to deviate from them. You have such statements in Titus 1.9 and in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast the form of sound words. You can equate sound words, wholesome words with the pattern. Same idea to Titus, both of them preachers of the gospel. Yet they were to hold fast the pattern of sound words. After the days of Moses and the days of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 22, this is said, verse 28. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should so say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings nor for sacrifice, but it is a witness between us and you. The pattern is certainly a word that fits in to the sound doctrine. And yet, I guess we should expect over the years some people to say, well, the New Testament's not an infallible divine pattern. But we have these words that says, no, it's an absolute objective, static standard of truth. That's what he's talking about. It's the measuring rod for determining right and wrong. And I want to talk to you about this pattern. Hold fast the form of sound words. Make all things according to the pattern. And that's the application the inspired writer of Hebrews makes of Moses' own admonition of the children of Israel under the law. That we too today in spiritual Israel, the church, should make all things according to the pattern. That basically is, is what's being said in the scripture that's on the wall above my head, Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. To do something in the name of Christ is to do it by His authority. Now where does Christ authorize anything? In His words, but where is that? the New Testament of Jesus Christ, the perfect, complete law of liberty, James 1, verse 25. So God's always demanded that his pattern or blueprint be followed in exactness. This says again why we should learn how the Bible authorizes and how we're to ascertain the authority of our Lord from it. It all ties into 2 Timothy 2.15 where we're admonished, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We've had occasion here recently to refer to knowing the ark in Genesis 6. And you see that when God looked down upon Noah and the wicked world around him, and verse 8 says that he found grace in God's sight, he found favor, then God gave him the plan for he and his family to be saved from the coming judgment on the world and water. 
and God specified the dimensions of that, that ark. He specified the arrangement of the material that made it up. And you'll see that Noah was approved of God because he acted on the basis of the divine pattern he had or he acted by the authority of the Lord in preparing that ark. And thus, Genesis 6:22, Moses says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Think about it for a minute. Wouldn't you like that to be said honestly and truthfully on your tombstone? That you did all God commanded you. And that would be a wonderful thing. It should be what should be about all of us. People today are pretty well told, do as you please. God's grace is such that you're human and you're going to sin anyway. So he loves you and there's no real bearing up under the cross. There's just, his grace is going to cover you. He's such a loving God, he's going to save you. You do not find that taught in either the Old or New Testaments. The idea is that if you love me, keep my commandments. The idea is that the faith that obeys or the saves is the faith that obeys. Hebrews 5 and verse 9. It's always been that way. No one trying to earn or merit salvation. They're trying to show God they love Him and have faith in He and His system of salvation by obeying Him. Now, if you decide that you can show your faith in God or that you love God with all that you are and have, without obeying Him, tell me how you do it. Well, you can't. You just can't. The only way I can demonstrate my love of God and godly things is to learn His will for my life and in the time I have on earth to receive it and obey it. The same thing is true of my faithful service to Him, especially if you the fact that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. My confidence, my trust, my belief in God and Christ and the gospel system is based upon a thus saith the Lord. And I trust in Him on the basis of what the Word of God says. I recognize, as I've said many times, a lot of people say, well, I believe that and I believe this. Well, what they really mean is I think that and I think this. Any time, brethren, that we say, I believe thus and so when it comes to spiritual matters, we ought to be able to go to a direct statement in the Bible, an example, or that which is implied, or don't say you believe it. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So whatever we do in word or in deed, we ought to have Bible authority for it. That's how we live according to the pattern. So as did Noah, same was true of Moses. The fact of the matter is, same is true of everybody that's ever been faithful to God. As the Bible defines that faith, he understood that he, that is Noah, was to make all things according to the pattern. And thus, we ought to have that as our goal as we hold fast the form of sound words. You're holding the pattern. Now, I'd like to look for a moment at the divine pattern for the church. You would think, in view of the way people treat the church, the way people think of the church, what they say about it, that really it just anything goes. That's pretty much the denominational attitude. Well, with people move farther and farther away from the Bible in general, belief in God or the deity of Christ, you can expect more and more of that kind of thing. Jesus promised his disciples concerning how we got the New Testament of Christ. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit was the revealer of the mind of God and the confirmer that that word was from heaven and not from men by miracles, signs, and wonders. He enabled men to work. And we need to hold to that pattern regarding the infallibility of the Scriptures. And we don't need any man-made creeds, whether they're written down or not. And we don't need to hold our own opinions and traditions to the point of where they set aside the Word of God. You'll remember that Jesus promised to build his church in Matthew 16, 18. In this particular passage, he assures us that the Holy Spirit would deliver the divine pattern, that is, to the matter of what was said to the apostles concerning the work of the Spirit with them in getting us the New Testament. The Holy Spirit's the revealer of truth. 
And he has once delivered it. Read Galatians chapter 1. And Paul says, Though we are an angel from heaven preaching yet the gospel unto you, then that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. The American Standard says, Cut off. That's how God feels about people who teach contrary to the pattern or against the pattern, or they don't use wholesome words. They're damning men's souls to hell. If not, why does he act like he does and say what he writes as he did? Notice that he again promised, our Lord did, to the apostles, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he'll guide you into all truth. Well, why is that the case? Because he will not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He'll show you things to come. John 16, 13. Not said to people in general, but to the apostles of Christ concerning their work he chose them to do as witnesses. Well, on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, the full gospel message was preached. And we find the apostles spake as the Spirit gave them utterance, Acts 2, 4. They spake in other languages by miracle, but what did they speak in those languages? The people that heard them, they speak, said they speak the wonderful works of God. The Spirit safeguarded the divine pattern, and they have present, or He has presented it incorruptible to us, 2 Timothy 2, verses 17 and 18. One fact just take from actually Second Timothy two fifteen all the way through the end of the chapter, because he's admonishing the study of the Bible, staying with the truth, learning it, right and dividing it, and that all scriptures give him inspiration of God. In speaking of the revelation of the gospel, the inspired apostle Paul asserted, But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Well, since the Spirit is God, and he knows the mind of God. Then he wrote, Which thing also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 13. The American Standard has it, 1901, combining spiritual things with spiritual words. In other words, the thoughts of God, the ideas of God, are in the Word of God. He chose those things, and in guiding men in the original in the New Testament, according to a common Greek, then they wrote as God guided them. You can't tamper with it. Paul has given this sober warning, and we want to note it. Written to the brethren at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, For we are laborers together, with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building according to the grace of God which is given unto me. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereupon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay and that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11. We have an obligation to be careful what we teach. We're going to be held accountable for that. We dealt with that in James not long ago about be not many teachers. And you can't teach what you don't know. And you need to use your time correctly to learn. And then not be moved away from these sound words or the pattern. In Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, Paul wrote to the church, Ye are, and then he said, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple of the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for habitation of God through the Spirit. Now that's saying we have the Word of God on this earth. It has been proven to be just that, the Word of God. God doesn't ask us to accept the Bible without any proof. It's right the opposite. Or he wouldn't have said, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. So the pattern's here, the divine infallible pattern. It's our obligation to do all we can to learn it and to follow it. There is then a pattern for sound doctrine. Remember, Paul wrote to the young preacher Timothy, hold the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard from me, 
in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1, verse 13. This anything goes society that's been around for a long time in America and shows no evidence, I think, of going away, of anything getting worse, if such is possible. There's always going to be a need for the Lord's church to hear this as well as the world. When people are considering becoming a Christian, they're not considering, if they know the Bible at all, of becoming a member of a man-made church. When a person hears and understands the gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16, that person is not seeking to change it to suit himself. He's seeking to understand it that he might obey it. And thus, we would become Christians when we obey it. But that obedience means a transformation of one's life. That's what we mean by conversion. You're not what you were before you became a Christian. Now you're something different. Well, why? Because you've embraced the knowledge of Christ for your life and how you're to live and your viewpoint on life. Your viewpoint's beginning with yourself, why you're here, what you're doing here, what you're to be doing here, and where you're going. Notice the emphasis in 1 Timothy 1.13. Actually, we'll see it in Titus because that's where both are emphasizing the importance of sound doctrine. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. Titus 2, 7 and 8. Now you take both those passages together along with all sorts of other matters pertaining to the same and you'll see the importance of knowing your Bible. I don't think we ever can emphasize enough of this business of knowing the Bible and knowing that you know it. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, you're my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 31 and 32. Well, you can or you can't. You do it and you will or you do it and you won't. Did Jesus tell the truth? Certainly he did. The problem is on our part of having the dedication and the hungering and thirsting after righteousness to compel us to never quit, never stop searching, never see, stop bringing our minds in subjection to the truth we've learned. Sound speech then is necessary to fulfill the pattern, and that's our point. Again, Paul said, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, Titus 2, 1. And he further charged that an elder must be adept in holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers, Titus 1.9. I don't know how a person can look at the qualifications of elders and say that he can remain ignorant of the truth and be what a shepherd of the flock must be in view of what the Bible says his work is. Now notice how zealously the Apostle Paul guarded the pattern of the gospel. He says, and I've referred to this already in Galatians 1, but to the Galatian churches, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God unto another gospel, literally a gospel of a different kind from what I preach to you, which is not another, not another kind of gospel that works, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That word pervert is hardly used nowadays. Because if you talk about any kind of conduct, nobody thinks any kind of conduct is perverted. But it is. If you are lately over somebody using the word gay, well, no, they're homosexuals, they're sodomites. I don't run them down for that. The Bible says certain ones heard the gospel in that day and time when there were plenty of them around. They believed it, they repented, and they changed their life. No, that's perverted. It's perverted lifestyle, it's corrupted. And the church can't be quiet about it. And whether we have two members of a church or 50 or 500, if we're faithful and true to the pattern, we'll preach the truth on all matters of morality. And we'll show people you can't live that way and go to heaven. Oh, you may do that here and be fully acceptable to everybody else. Be the darling of this social matter or whatever else. But it's not going to change that with God. It's the Bible that teaches us how God views things. If you ever become a Christian, you'll have to say, well, what is my lifestyle? Is it in harmony with the truth or do I need to turn from the way I'm conducting my life and embrace the truth? I assure you that everybody that obeys the gospel, no matter how early in life or later in life, 
there are things to turn from, and that is done at repentance. We're commanded you must repent, having believed in Christ, repented of our sins. Then we can confess him and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you don't repent, it's not going to do you a bit of good to be dunked under the water all day long. Any more than if you were an atheist and says, I want to be, I want to be baptized for the remission of sins. It won't work. The whole, every step of the plan of salvation indicates a change about you. A change to acceptance of the truth and your willingness to abide by it, no matter the sacrifices that you make. That's why Christ said, take up your cross daily and follow me. He goes ahead to say, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Galatians 1, 6 through 8 again. Now, the question, why was Paul, why was Paul so firm about this? Well, he said this a little later on in the chapter, that is, the Galatian epistle, chapter 1, 11, and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Well, then where did you get it, Paul? Where did it come from? How did you learn it? For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul, as an apostle of Christ, received what we know is the New Testament doctrine directly from Christ, as did each one of the apostles. That was one of the points made as we started the lesson in the work of the Holy Spirit with the apostles. That didn't happen with everybody, but it did with the apostles. The early church knew it, for it said of them in Acts 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Well, are the apostles teaching in word the same thing they taught orally when inspiration was in man? Yes, they are. If I want to know what any apostle believed when he walked this earth, all I have to do is read what they wrote, and I'll know what they believed. And Paul said that to the Ephesians. If you read what I wrote, you'll, have, you'll know what I know in the mystery of Jesus Christ. I think sometimes we get an idea, well, if any of the apostles could come back today and we would ask them about something, they give us a gift answer. But Paul took care of that, didn't he, in Galatians 1? He said, even if an apostle taught you anything different from what I taught to originally, let him be what? And add angels to that. Let him be cut off. Let him be accursed. And thus, Paul was set in defense of the pure pattern of sound doctrine. He said to the church of Philippi, Philippians 1 and verse 17, that very thing, I'm set for the defense of the gospel. I'm set like concrete. I will not be moved off of it. I'm not going to change. People think that if you're not changing all the time, there's something wrong with you. When you know that you know that you know the truth and you're still living by it, you don't change. If you see that you're not, you change. And that's the way it was meant to be. You repent of things that you're doing or not doing that the Bible does not authorize you to do. Thus, you embrace the truth. That is conversion. So we must be mindful of those things. We want to follow the truth without addition, subtraction, or alteration in any way. So what should be our attitude toward all who refuse the pattern as we've talked about it this morning? It's not hard. The pattern itself tells us. The inspired apostle John said to Christians as he was writing 2 John 9 through 11, Whosoever transgresseth, the American standard says, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, neither receive him into his house, neither bid him God's speed. For if you bid him God's speed, you are a partaker of his evil deed. I've seen some people come along and say, well, I don't believe what he believes. Well, do you believe it's wrong? Yeah. Well, you're going ahead and supporting him. Well, I don't believe it. Well, John covered that in Second John 9 through 11. He said, you don't have to believe it and teach it. To be guilty of the same thing a false teacher teaches. Just support him. You can even deny that you believe it. Just support him and say he's in fellowship with us and everything's all right. Not only are we to follow the pattern of sound words which God has given, we're also to withdraw from all who do not hold that pattern. When I say withdraw, I mean what is peculiar to Christians and the fellowship we have with one another because we are Christians. In other words, the, the New Testament pattern sets out what Christian fellowship is. And we have no authority to change those parameters. None whatsoever. If you can change the parameters 
of Christian fellowship for those in the church, why can't you change a part of the gospel plan of salvation? You have as much authority to change any step in the plan of salvation toward one becoming a Christian as you do to change things that God says are necessary to be faithful in the church. And you have no authority to do either one. It's our important action, mentally and physically, to know the truth and to live according to it. If we condone people's actions, we then become partakers of their evil deeds. We can't do that. That's the reason our example before a world outside of Christ must be that of godliness. And we don't show any support of the ungodliness, which is common and acceptable to them. Ignoring or rejecting this divine pattern, then we're going to find ourselves completely cut loose from God. Think for a moment. The inspired of the Holy Spirit, divine pattern, the authorized will of Christ. What does it cover? Well, if you're a man, it tells you how to be a man. How God wants you to be God's man. When you're marrying your husband, in fact, it'll even tell you what scriptural marriage is. It'll tell you who can be married and who can't as far as God is concerned. It'll also tell you about as a husband, here's what God says you must do to be a faithful husband. And when a father, it'll tell you exactly how fathers ought to act as faithful fathers. You can bring that right over to a woman, a wife, and a mother. You can come right down to the family as to the obligations of children in the family and their responsibility. Uh, as a son, as a brother in the family, the same as a girl, a daughter, and a sister. It addresses what it is to be a godly friend, even how to be a godly enemy. Have you ever noticed that? It tells you how to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. It puts the limitations on that love and shows you how far you can go. It even tells you how to be a citizen where you're living like the New Testament says you ought to. It covers everything. That's the reason that we study the Bible and we talk about Colossians 3.17. Sometimes I think we just, you know, well, this covers what we do as we're assembled in the worship. I leave this, I'll make up my own mind, do what I want to do. It doesn't. You're covered every way as far as life and the flesh is concerned by the authority of Jesus Christ. Everything that we're to be in order to save our souls from a devil's hell and glorify Jehovah God Almighty through his Holy Son Jesus is set out in the words of the New Testament pattern. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and on and on we could go. I don't know how you can say it more clearly, and you'll notice we haven't tried to get into detail on these things. We have in many other sermons over the years, but we're just simply calling our mind back to the fact we can't turn loose of this pattern. If people don't like it, if they hate us, if they're basing their friendship on how much we will compromise the truth, we even know what it is, we, we must learn what it is to compromise. And if we don't spend time with God's mind, get that, if we don't spend time with God's thinking, God's mind, then we're going to go off after something. Well, the only place he reveals his mind is in his word, and that's the Bible, and more specifically, the New Testament of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. For he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. So if you're subject then to the gospel, you need to know it's unchanging. It's our duty to know it, to believe it, and to obey it. If you need to become a Christian this morning, you need to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Having done that, you're qualified then to obey the commandment to repent of your sins, Acts 17.30. Confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10.10, and then be buried with the Lord in baptism by His authority. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to obtain the remission or forgiveness of your sins. Matthew 16, 18, verses following, Acts 2, 38, Mark 16, 16, verse Peter 3, 21, Romans 6, 3, and 4, and on and on we go as to the Word of God from the divine pattern that sets out the plan of salvation. If you obey that, you'll become a Christian. Well, what kind of Christian? Just a Christian. Why would you want to be anything else than Christian, which means of Christ? For the Lord will add you to his church, not some man-made outfit, Acts 2, 47. And in that church, you'll faithfully serve him and worship him as the New Testament teaches us. In the same word, it taught you how to become a Christian. And you'll not ever be connected with any man-made outfit. If you are, 
you need to get out of it because it's not authorized by God. Now, that's plain, plain teaching. But you have the same Bible I do. And God hasn't said one thing to you and it's something completely different than to me. And so to every man. It is absolute and objective, humanly attainable truth if you will but embrace it. As a child of God, if you've erred from this divine pattern, you need to repent of those sins. That's God's second law of pardon. Turn from those sins in repentance, praying God for forgiveness, confessing those sins. If you need to do that, we sing an invitation song now. Why? It's customary after hearing the message of God preached in which you're imploring people to believe and obey the gospel to encourage them to respond to the invitation of Christ. For he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your soul. And thus we sing songs encouraging people to act upon the most important thing in their life, being reconciled to God, obedience to the gospel, or being restored to the first love. So if you're subject to the Lord's blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.